Hello and welcome to the Think Big series, a collection of dialogues with leading speakers brought to you by PSG. I'm Alicia Seckham. Now, we're all well aware of the semigration trend that's taken a hold of South Africa. In fact, by some estimates, uh, it's suggested that by 2032, the city of Cape Town's population would have grown by 850,000 people to 5.6 million. By 2037, in just 13 years, the Western Cape will be home to over 9 million people. So today, we're talking governing a fast-growing city, especially in an election year. And we're catching up with Executive Mayor of Cape Town, Jordan Hill-Lewis, taking a closer look at some of the challenges municipalities come up against, including the delivery of basic services, but also at the workarounds and where investments need to be made to ensure progress despite the constraints. And then beyond that, if we do get to that working model, how we start to scale it nationally. Mayor, thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to have you in conversation. And I'm going to start off with semigration. It's now part of the national lexicon and that in part speaking to the city of Cape Town successes and the opportunity that comes with that from the onset. Your mission was to build an incredible city in five years. Two years into the job, knowing what you know now and looking at the runway left on that timeline, still a viable target? Well, I think Cape Town already is a, a, an incredible city. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's really great to join you. I, I, I really do think Cape Town is a, already an incredible city, but our, our, my mission was to build a city that could be uh, resilient against all of those pressures that you've discussed and many others. Others besides resilient against the growing examples of state failure and service delivery failure at a national level, uh, resilient against climate pressures, which is a major uh, issue in, in Cape Town, as we all know. Uh, and through building that sense of resilience and, and uh, preparing for the, for the future uh, to give set people a clear sense of, of uh, optimism and hopefulness that you can do the same we can overcome the challenges that we face in South Africa. The the, the challenges are profound and and many, uh, but that's not to say that they cannot be overcome. Uh, and so the, the idea was the, the idea in Cape Town was to just demonstrate that as difficult as these things are, you can head in the right direction. You can make progress. And I think that we're doing that uh, quite well. The city's in a very, very good space. So much so, Jordan, that you're now in implementation phase. And I'm going to ask you a threefold question here, if I can. You know, what are the priorities? What are the real tangible actions that it's triggering? And with what impact so far? So the, I think the primary job of every city in the world is actually infrastructure. Uh, that is what makes a city work and function. And there's, you know, there's an apocryphal story about uh, sharks that if they if they stop moving, they, uh, you know, they have to constantly move. If they if they stop moving, they die. A city is a bit like that. If it, unless it is constantly investing in infrastructure, it is uh, it's in trouble very quickly. And we see that all over uh, South Africa happening right now, because we have had, uh, you know, roughly two decades of underinvestment in infrastructure in South African cities. Those cities are just absolutely at breaking point uh, as a result. And at first, these things, you don't notice them because your infrastructure can can survive for a year or two or five or 10 even without without maintenance and and investment. But eventually, everything's going to start breaking. And, and that is what we are seeing. So in Cape Town, we are we are just constantly investing in infrastructure to keep up with the pressure of people moving to our city, this immigration you spoke of, and to make sure that our current infrastructure is working for, for the next 50, 100 years so that we never have the kind of infrastructural collapse you, you see happening there. So that is the first and most important job of cities. And people misunderstand that because, of course, in South Africa, where you've got so much poverty, there's always, it's, there's always temptation to spend money on other things. But every rand that you spend on something else is a rand that you are not investing in the basic building blocks of what makes cities work: uh, the roads, the under uh, the underground yeah. infrastructure, the power grid, the water grid, uh, all of that. And so you have to focus on that. 
Secondly, it was very clear to me and still is clear to me that the biggest thing killing the slowly uh, killing the South African economy is load shedding. And, you, you know, I think for too long, South Africans accepted that or maybe not accepted, but got into this frame of mind that we had to just wait for ESCOM uh, uh, to fix. And, and my view was that uh, I don't think ESCOM will fix it. I still don't think that's the case. I think if it's going to be fixed, it's going to be fixed by us, by by South Africans, uh, making a plan as we as we often do and and do very well. And so, yeah, at a city level, we are trying to buy uh, hundreds of megawatts. We are buying. We're, we're nearly finished actually buying hundreds of megawatts of of additional power for our city grid. We maintain a city grid in in Cape Town that is very well maintained and and performs very well. But we don't generate power except for the steel brass hydro dam. So we are buying generated power for our own grid so that we can end load shedding. And that that will be a huge, huge moment for uh, for the city economy. The economy is already doing well and growing growing faster than the rest of the country. But that will be a, a kind of breakout growth uh, moment. Uh, and then I think the there's not many cities of 5 million people around the world that can function successfully without a... Uh, a, a kind of high-speed rail or some kind of mass rail okay. public transport system. And uh, South African cities are among that short list of, of very few cities that, that, have, that do not have this. Uh, because unfortunately, our rail system in South Africa is one of those things that we have to build resilience for because uh, it's, it's one of those examples of national failure. So our, our approach has been we, we have to try and push hard to to take over the management of passenger rail in Cape Town. I still believe that that is inevitable. It's a question of how long it takes rather than if, if it's going to happen. Uh, and we hope that it is, is sooner rather than later. And we, we're just going to keep knocking on that door and, until eventually it, it opens. Uh, because we're already looking ahead to the future, to a city of 10 million people and saying, if we are going to, you, you, you know, you 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 really can't run a city that size without a functioning rail system. So we have to plan for the future. In okay, the meantime, so we've got it. Yeah. infrastructure and connectivity, right? I've got to ask you, yeah, had and governing in an election year felt any different with the uh, you know, political dynamics or ideological challenges getting in the way of what needs to be done? And I guess what I'm getting to is, has implementation become tougher in an election year? No, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, we we set a long term strategy. Uh, we plan. We try to get out of the the uh, the political cycle of short termism, which which mm -hmm. is a curse uh, to governance. Uh, we once we've decided on the right strategy, you pursue it relentlessly uh, until you get to implementation and eventually to results. And you can't be distracted uh, by you know the the increasing temperature during uh during an election year so certainly the temperature the political temperature is increasing and it's going to increase dramatically uh but you 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 don't take that personally it's it's a feature of the democratic political cycle and you get on with the job yeah what you were alluding to jordan was you know the challenge that comes with how much sits in your control how much sits outside of your control so how much of a solution does widening the mandate for not just provincial government but cities themselves put on the table you know putting control of power closer to the people at municipal level as opposed to having sit at national level i really think this is a crucial important part of the the future for governance in south africa we mm -hmm. have to uh, shake free and dislodge some of that uh, tight control and and uh, and power hoarding at the center and send it down to the periphery to competent local governments and metros where they exist now of course i understand the argument from central government they will say well look look across local government in south africa it's basically a wasteland of dysfunction and uh, corruption and uh, bankruptcy and so on how can you expect us to uh, to add uh, further greater powers to to these municipalities i understand that but mm. uh, but where there are examples of capacity and competence and success you should empower those examples don't don't starve them of uh, of ability or space to do more 
Uh, and, and that's the case that we're making very strongly in policing, in, uh, in public transport, the rail system, uh, in energy. We've already made that case. And basically, we've already won it in energy. And just look at the difference that that has made. That's the perfect case study. When those, when those regulations were loosened and space was opened up, uh, private companies, big mining companies and so on, moved into that space to solve the problem. And our city moved into that space to solve the problem for ourselves. And in a few years when load shedding is gone, it will not be because of anything that, that ESCOM has done. It will be because of this. Uh, and, and so that's a great example of how uh, just offering more space and power and, and, and policy latitude at, at a local and provincial level can help solve problems. So my call to the central government has been always, let's use Cape Town as a kind of policy experimentation laboratory. Uh, let's try things that, that we haven't tried in South Africa. And, you know, what's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work, but it's not working at the moment. Trains are not working right now. <laughs> So, uh, so I, I, I strongly suspect it's going to be a better outcome than that. And, and that's not hard to achieve. Uh, yeah. So let's, let's experiment. Look, you've been emphatic about government functions being better managed at local level, calling for, like you say, the devolution of passenger rail systems, ports, policing even. And, yes. you know, in part answered my question, does that hold true, whether you are, are or aren't the ones running things at municipal level? But I guess the focus then uh, gets put on competence, which you highlighted there. Ultimately, the finger is pointed directly at accountability and good governance. You seem to have gotten a handle on that. How do we as a country start getting things more right in that regard? The most important thing and the secret of, of Cape Town and the Wind Cape success is a professional civil service. We, we politicians like to take credit for things, but we don't deserve the credit. The credit belongs to the thousands of people who work in this building where I am right now, who are absolutely dedicated professionals, who love their jobs, and who know, and this is where the, the, the political leadership does make a difference, they know that they are judged on their performance on, and on the value that they add, not on the basis of uh, their political loyalty or uh, you know, whose favor they hold or whatever, uh, who they vote for. All of that is utterly irrelevant. What, what counts is your professionalism. And, and over time, that compounds a, a little bit like compound interest. Here, at, uh, I'm at least speaking to an audience that is very familiar with the concept of compound interest. But con compound interest adds and builds momentum over time. At first, it's imperceptible and slow, and then eventually it's just this roaring power. Uh, and and that's, that's exactly what professionalism in the civil service does as well. Uh, you want people doing their best. Uh, there's thousands of things going on here every day that I don't even know about to be able to trust that the people doing them are all doing their best and applying their minds and, and applying best practice from around the world. That is the number one secret. What political leaders have to do is create an environment that supports that, uh, that, that where, where uh, political loyalty is, is, is never a factor, where corruption is rooted out ruthlessly. That's not to say that it never exists. There's, there's 33,000 people working here. Of course that it does. Mm -hmm. But you root it out. Whenever you become aware of it, you root it out ruthlessly. And then eventually over time, you create a culture of performance, of excellence, of doing your best, constantly raising the bar. Uh, and and the, the public are the major beneficiaries of that. Look, these are the signals investors are looking for, right? Good governance, no leaking buckets, where there are holes, accountability, timelines, and at the end of the day, return on investment. And you're ensuring this progress, like you say, through your people, despite uh, being hamstrung, I guess, by various uh, constraints. So let's talk capital commitment here. Reduced budget in mind, what risk are you pricing in of plans being thrown off because of capex or budgetary constraints? Yeah, that's a great question because of course there are profound capital constraints and there shouldn't be, by the way, there should not be. Let me say that South Africa has enough money to spend on infrastructure, we just don't prioritize it. The fact that that uh, there have been infrastructure cuts in this latest budget is unforgivable. I wrote to the finance minister at the time and said, you know, if the infrastructure has to be protected, cut elsewhere. I understand cuts have to happen, but for goodness mm -hmm. sake, look at our cities. Look what's happening in our cities. We need infrastructure investment 
like we've never seen before. And in, and instead, those budgets have been cut. So in Cape, even in Cape Town, a city that is, uh, you know, financially well run, we have very low debt. We cannot afford to spend uh, tens of billions of rands uh, from our own money. Cities just don't have that kind of of uh, of financial muscle. So we'll spend all we can, and we'll raise a bit of uh, new debt uh, when it is well priced. But but really, we need to come to the party with big infrastructure uh, budgets and grants to to support our major cities. Uh, the so we have had to trim our sales a little bit because of these national budget cuts, infrastructure grant cuts, and that's very disappointing. But we are trying every other way to fund them. I'm you know I'm going to see the international finance uh, institutions. The German Development Bank has been very generous to us with very very well priced concessional uh, uh, loans. The French Development Bank and, and so on. So, uh, uh, a little bit from DBSA. So we can fund a, a capital program that far outstrips any other city in the country. And to put it into perspective, it is now double uh, Johannesburg and Durban combined, our our uh, our capital budget here in Cape Town. Yeah. And also, Jordan, we, we're missing the step in PPPs, right? The role yes. of the private sector, because that can't be downplayed given the state of the national budget and the constrained uh, you know, fiscal capacity. You're leveraging private capital in Cape Town to democratize energy and ensure better energy security as just one example. What's the mm -hmm. thinking around extrapolating what you're doing in the energy space right now as a working model into those other categories that you highlighted? Ports, rail, policing, etc. Undoubtedly, I mean, we're we're already doing it. We've actually just uh, taken a decision formally, a, a, a public decision to uh, to start a PPP process for the supply of new water for Cape Town. So uh, desalination and water reuse plants. Those are so expensive. Those are in the region of you know five to eight billion rand each. Uh, so, so those it's better for that to be provided uh, off of our balance sheet and on the private sector's balance sheet, and uh, and so we've you know we're definitely pursuing that. We're going to be doing the same in some of the big uh, highway projects, the famous unfinished highways in Cape Town. They will be finished, but they will be finished as a as a PPP, uh, probably because of the cost of of doing those projects. So I think this increasingly has to become part of, of South Africa's infrastructure uh, future, and it will be, be because of necessity. But remember, keep in mind, there are some natural limitations. You can only really do PPPs where there's a clear flow of revenue. So you can yeah. do it for a water plant or a desalination plant because there's a clear flow of revenue that's, that can pay back the, uh, the private sector. But when you're doing underground sewer pipes or uh, or uh, you know, some uh, lighting, maybe public lighting projects or other big infrastructure projects where there's no clear flow of revenue, then it has to be done by the state and uh, and by the city's balance sheet. Okay, so the clear lines here, you know, and what can, uh, you know, venture down that PPP space and what can't. Can you pin down a figure for us? I mean, what level of investment flows are you actually seeing right now from the private sector? So we we've got a hundred and twenty billion rand capital pipeline uh, over the next nine years. Uh, that's quite front loaded as well. Is about is about forty billion just in the next uh, three years. So uh, it's it's quite front heavy. We're doing huge infrastructure investment right now. Of that, at the moment, only about ten percent uh, will be PPPs, and ninety percent will be funded by ourselves. And that 10% will mainly be those two big water projects. Of course, I'm not including uh, all of the massive energy projects that we are procuring now uh, because those are those are basically already done. The, the procurement yeah. stage is, is finished and now that goes on to uh, construction. They, they, you know, they could go away and start to build soon. So that's probably another, uh, you know, six or seven billion rand in in energy infrastructure being invested by the private sector there as well. So that that gets you to uh, probably 15, 18 percent of our total uh, pipeline. 
Okay, got you. So that's on the one hand, right? You've got this big focus on infrastructure and you're starting to get things right in terms of uh, coming up with financing mechanisms to support that. But then on the other hand, you come up against the extortion of building contracts and the so-called uh, mafia disruptions. We've seen the recent headlines, service delivery efforts won't be derailed by construction mafia. How are you making sure of that? This is tough. This is tough. Uh, you know, I, I always say this, uh, this is a wonderful job. There's not much that that stresses me out. But this is the one thing that uh, that does stress me out because it it impacts directly on service delivery and overwhelmingly in poorer communities. You know, we're busy doing a, a big highway project uh, in Belleville. That that project is not disrupted at all. But a, but a, a beautiful public transport project in Mitchell's Plain or in Philippi or in Kailicha is constantly disrupted by extortionists or, or or people trying to muscle their way in, sometimes violently, into those projects. Our biggest housing project in the whole city, 3,500 homes under construction in Delft, that's, that uh, project is is paused because of, of these uh, disruptions. So it is a real, real issue. We are determined that we will never, ever do business with uh, with these uh, these organized criminals. We will never, ever give in to a single one of these demands. In fact, we've taken quite an unprecedented step uh, by finding where they are trying to infiltrate our supply chain process by registering kind of shell companies and front companies. Uh, we've actually just blacklisted 16 of those companies that we've become aware of and will ruthlessly blacklist any others that we become aware of. We will not do business with uh, with extortionists. That's That's just never going to happen. Because the, as soon as you do it once, uh, yeah, precedent's been set. Yeah, you know, then then uh, you've you've lost the battle. So, uh, so so I would rather, as as difficult and, and as sad as it is, I would rather cancel a project and spend the money uh, elsewhere if if the if extortionists insist on uh, on not letting it proceed. But what's much more important, actually is that the South African police start to take this matter very seriously. Mm -hmm. This is happening in Richards Bay, it's happening in Durban, it's happening across KZN, it's now happening in Cape Town and, and other parts of the Western Cape, it's happening in Joburg. Uh, we cannot allow South Africa to become what, uh, you know, what is called a mafia state, where, where no project can go ahead unless you pay off the right people. That cannot be our future. So we Absolutely. have to, it's, it's not, it's not for the city to do this because we have law enforcement. We can't intercept uh, electronic payments. We can't intercept people's phone calls and emails. That's, that's totally above our pay grade. We've got to have uh, crime intelligence and state security actually going into these criminal networks and breaking them from the, from the inside and, and with the right evidence. And I really okay. think uh, this, this has to be a national priority now. Absolutely, Jordan. Uh, you know, a national priority. It's got to have a focus if we're going to see investment and development continue, right? You mentioned that being one of your stress points or the big stress factor for you right now. Does the scale and pace of investment keep up with the pace at which people are coming your way? Because let's look at another potential stress factor. You face the risk of an influx of people, perhaps faster than the investment taps are flowing. Yeah. So how do you sustain infrastructure and basic service delivery so that you keep up with the demand that's going to start to put pressure on current systems, potentially collapsing the progress you've made? This is probably the biggest uh, pressure point that the city faces. I, I use the analogy of running on a treadmill. You've got to run, uh, but you, you're running constantly, but you're not going anywhere because uh, the, the the treadmill is moving just as fast as you're running. Uh, and it, sometimes it does feel like that uh, because the, the, the pace of people moving here, particularly in, uh, you know, moving into informality. Mm. We're just seeing a huge explosion of informality across the city. And, and by the way, Cape Town's not unique in this. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the the Status A census shows that Joburg and Ikuraleni on the uh, in the east of Gauteng is is are growing even faster in the informal space. Uh, so it's it, it, this puts immense pressure on the city because you have a constant expansion of people that need to receive free basic services. Uh, they have to be cross subsidised by uh, by the 
the, the same pool of, of rate payers. And it's also very difficult to get uh, infrastructure into those spaces. So you have to rely on temporary services like chemical toilets, which are not, uh, not pleasant and, and as dignified as we would want uh, people to have. But it's impossible to install underground, uh, sophisticated uh, sewer network infrastructure where a, you know, a place is completely uh, occupied by informality. So the, the pressures are huge. And, and one, of the, one of the ways that I want to try and keep up with this, if you look at infrastructure investment in Cape Town over the last, say, decade, there has been huge investment, but the investment has not kept up with population growth. So actually, if you just think about that treadmill, we've been moving slightly, even though we're running, you're moving slightly backwards all the time on this, on this treadmill. And so one of the budget rules that we have put in place, I see budget rules are now becoming popular at a national level. I'm very pleased by that, by the way, because I, I proposed them in parliament when I was a member of parliament a few years ago. Uh, but w when I got here, I, I, I instituted a budget rule that says Cape Town's uh, infrastructure budget will grow by at least uh, population growth plus inflation every year. So you add population growth and inflation, and then you know at least you are keeping up with the pressure. It might not, you're still not getting ahead of the curve, but at least yeah. you're not falling behind it. Okay, and that's a part of the solution to seeing that you don't compromise the resilience and the sustainability yeah. that you are investing in today, right? But yeah. having said that, Jordan, you're well aware of the criticism. South Africa's best performing metro is interested only in the interests of a few. And many are questioning the strategy regarding, uh, you know, the low income population, low cost housing sprawl, informal settlement expansion that you've mentioned there, the homeless situation. Are you not telling a tale of two cities here? No, I don't think so. I mean, this, just uh, last week we opened the uh, state of the art. It's the it's the most state of the art wastewater treatment works in in Africa. Uh, the the engineers tell me, in Kailicha, a massive brand new Zanflit uh, wastewater treatment works to deliver much much more dignified, better uh, waste uh, sewage infrastructure and and services in that entire catchment. Kailicha, Mfuleni, Delft, Blue Downs some of the poorest and some of the most fast growing parts of Cape Town. Uh, we the, the biggest infrastructure project in the whole of the Western Cape and one of the biggest government infrastructure projects in the country is our current expansion of our My City bus system, again, to Kyalitsha, Mitchell's Plain, Philippi, Crossroads, Nyanga, linking through to Claremont, Weinberg, and to the CBD. That is a 10 billion rand expansion happening right now under construction. Uh, all of our, all of our, uh, uh, sewer network upgrades, the pipe upgrades, overwhelmingly in poorer communities. All of our safety investments, we've got a thousand dedicated officers every day just in 10 precincts. And it's uh, it's Harare, uh, Nyanga, Philippi, Crossroads, Lower Crossroads, Hanover Park, Lavender Hill, Delft. It's all the poor, uh, you know, the poorest hot, uh, crime hotspot communities in, in the city. So we are perfectly comp uh, confident that the huge majority of our meaningful uh, infrastructure budgets and our daily operational budgets are going into poorer communities where people need those services the most. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and the fact is that that narrative, that truth does not suit our political opponents. So, that, so they're going to keep saying the opposite, whether it's true or not. And you just have to come to terms with that and, and be at peace uh, uh, with that. But the fact of the matter is that the overwhelming majority, somewhere around 75% of every, uh, all of our budget, 75 cents of every rand that we spend goes into uh, the poorer communities of, of Cape Town with beautiful new services and infrastructure. And uh, you so aren't going I'm, it alone I'm, as well, right? Because private sector that? also, you, you aren't going it alone as well in some quarters as well, because private sector has been brought in releasing land parcels there. So that opening up a new range of possibilities as well. I just want to move this conversation along, Jordan. Uh, so sorry for the interruption. But given what you've learned from engagements with private sector and you know what it takes to build those partnerships, do you think the recent rhetoric from national government about how private sector is 
going to be brought in, incentivized in, is enough to put us on the right track to start scaling nationally now what you seem to be getting right in Cape Town? Well, yes, of course, that's encouraging. If we see what's happening in the Durban Harbour, that's that's very encouraging. It, uh, of course, it is way too slow and way too late. It, it's, uh, you know, it's the obvious thing. It's global best practice. It should have been done years ago. And my sincere hope is that it doesn't take another five or 10 years to expand that to other uh, parts of the public service, like the Cape Town Harbour or our, our trains and railways or... Mm our airline or, and I could, you know, the list goes on. Uh, we, we must take that model and apply it very, very quickly uh, in, in many aspects of our public sector. And at the same time, it's not helpful that government keeps attacking the private sector. We, we had this outrageous statement about how, uh, you know, uh, companies are, are uh, working on regime change. I can't remember the exact words, but some, something outrageous like that. I mean, I think the part of the reason Cape Town is doing well is because businesses know that they have a government here that fundamentally respects the role of the private sector as the actual job creators in our economy. Government mm. does not by, by itself create any jobs. Only the private sector does that, but it, it requires the state. It requires a, an environment that is conducive and positive to growing a business and investing and making a bet on the future. Uh, and that's that we understand that role. Uh, so, so yes, I, I think I'm encouraged by that. I just hope it doesn't take uh, another 10 years to roll out. I asked that question because, you know, instead of Cape independence, Cape exit, surely we should be now pushing more so for the inverse of that, you know, scaling the Cape's working model out to the rest of South exactly. Africa so that we see, uh, you know, the scale into the rest of the country and other municipalities successfully. On that note, are you building relationships with other cities despite political affiliation? Because you know, in private sector circles, collaborations become recognized as the key to success. And perhaps this is exactly what needs to translate to the public sector. Mm. I, I, I love how you've uh, phrased that. That's exactly right. Uh, we have zero interest in Cape Exit. We, we want to demonstrate Cape Town as a model of success for how South Africa can, can overcome its, its profound challenges of poverty uh, and, and low economic growth. We, we absolutely believe it is possible as, as passionate and patriotic South Africans. We want to show how it's, it's possible and use that elsewhere. And we have good relationships with most of the cities. Many of them come here to, to talk to us uh, often. Uh, and, uh, you know, at, a, at an official level, we have uh, relatively good relationships, particularly in, in the space of water, because Cape Town has already been through the worst in 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 2017 18 with the with the drought situation there and we've had to act very fast since then to uh, to to prepare for a water insecure future so we, you know we're doing a lot of good work with the cities on uh, at a at an official level on things like that and many other things besides this amidst a shifting political landscape, right? It's a fractured one with so many independents having sprung up. We may know how much a 50 plus 1% vote matters to govern effectively, but we face the real potential for coalitions instead. Have we hit an inflection point in South African politics? Absolutely, we have. And, uh, and it is wonderfully exciting, uh, incredibly exciting. If you've been involved in politics uh, or, you know, growing up as a young uh, political activist as I did, uh, or as I have, the, the, there was only really one question ever in South African politics, and that was, what was the size of the ANC's majority going to be? Is it going to be a two-thirds majority? Uh, and and now the question is a very different one. Is, is there going to be a majority at all? And I think if you believe all of the polls, there's not a single poll in South Africa today that that has the ANC winning this election. Uh, every one of them shows that the future will be a, a coalition government. Uh, so I think undoubtedly that is a major, major inflection point for South African politics. We cannot possibly underestimate the, the psychological power of that moment where this party that has dominated our politics, even though we are a true democracy, we've had a one-party uh, dominant democracy for, uh, for 30 years, 
that is officially over. That is a massive moment for, for South Africa, and I think an undoubtedly positive one. Of course, I'm sure your, your, your audience will immediately draw attention to some risks that come with that, and I'm not denying those mm -hmm. risks. Uh, but, but those risks still, I believe, are much better for South Africa's future than a future of another 30 years of one party just dominating uh, every election. So, Jordan, bottom line, as we wrap this conversation up, can South Africa make real progress towards unlocking meaningful growth in 2024 and beyond? Well, not in 2024, I'm afraid, because we have to have fundamental political change and better government policy. Uh, but we definitely can do it in the future. We absolutely can. And it is my mission and my uh, obsession and determination here in Cape Town to show that it can be done and to provide a working model for, for how we can do it in other cities in South Africa and indeed nationally. Uh, so I still am hugely optimistic about our country. When I look, cast my eye across the world, I, I, I feel like we're, we're actually uh, normal compared to the rest of uh, everyone else right now. Uh, and this is, a, this is a great place to be. There's still so much opportunity here, so much positivity for the future. Uh, and and uh, this is an extremely exciting year. Absolutely. Well, let's leave it there. And before I let you go, you know, a couple of weeks back, I was at a conference and I was reminded of a 1986 Ronald Reagan quote where he said, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are... <laughs> I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I mean, this was just over 40 years ago and I think it still resonates, right? But we've got to start shifting the narrative here and really start focusing on how government could work, how it should work, how it can work better into the future for that collective good. Jordan, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you today. So thanks so much for having joined us to our audience. Remember, the social media campaign on the series is hashtag ThinkBigPSG. The series is free, it's shareable, it's open to anyone interested, whether you're a PSG client or not. So please keep this conversation going. Until next time, from me, Alicia Seckham, it's goodbye. Thank you.